If you join me this afternoon in the fifth chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesian church. Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to begin at verse 24 and read through verse number 30. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse number 24, reading down through verse 30. The King James text today reads, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Then, excuse me, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are the members of the body, of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Praise the name of the Lord. If you bow your heads with me one more moment. Master, once again, God, we come before you desiring above all else the anointing, the presence, the power of the Holy Ghost as the word of God goes forth. Mere mortal man can offer nothing of substance or sustenance to the people of God outside of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. The anointing of the Holy Ghost turns a meek and fearful fisherman into a fearless and bold preacher of the gospel. Master, even as you turned Peter from one meek and lowly character into a bold leader who would play such an important role in the foundation of the church. Master, today anoint the speaker. Help me to overcome the physical issues that are trying to plague me today. And help me to be a blessing, an encouragement, a help, an inspiration to the people of God. I know on every ear that hears, touched by the Holy Ghost, that every hearer, Lord, might be receptive and able, willing to receive the engrafted Word of God. For we ask it today in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. You know, so many people love to go off on tyrants about the whole male-female uh, imagery that is used in the Word of God. And somehow, you know, the whole uh, male-female dynamic becomes this sacred thing. And what people do not realize is, and in reading our primary text today, we get a little glimpse, we get a little clue into something that I think a lot of people miss. And that is God uses every aspect of our natural existence to illustrate important truths within the spiritual realm. The concept of marriage between a man and a woman 
is present in the Word of God primarily to help illustrate, listen to me carefully children, to help illustrate the relationship between Christ and His church. In our primary text today, the Apostle Paul compares the relationship between a man and a woman to that of Christ and the church. He said, husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. How many men would be willing, are willing to lay down their lives for their spouses? He goes on to say that men ought to love their wives, even as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. I'm going to tell you something. As somebody who grew up in the home of a horrific narcissist who cared nothing about anyone or anything but himself, my father didn't care if he bought groceries. My father didn't care if his family ate. He literally did not care if his wife had food on her plate. Nor did he care if his children had food on their plates. There were many, and my father was not a drinker. It wasn't like he drank up his pay, at least that I know of. It's not like he drank up his paychecks or what have you. But the reality is, my father simply uh, just, he did all the grocery shopping. He had to control everything in our home. He never handed my mother money and said, here, go do some grocery shopping. No, that's not how he operated. If he he didn't buy the groceries. We didn't have groceries. When I was 16 years old and I was able to get my first job, I, I literally went and applied for a job at a local grocery store uh, about a month before my birthday. And I, Because in Connecticut you could not work uh, unless you were at least 16. Here in Alabama apparently you can go to work at 15. But in Connecticut you had to be a minimum of 16. I went to the manager of a local grocery store and told her, I said, I'll be turning 16 in a month and I was wondering if I might apply for a job. And she said, well certainly. And she had me fill out the application and she talked to me and she said, Charles, I'll tell you what, you come back here on September 19th and uh, you've got a job. And the 19th of September, my birthday came, I went right back to that store and she signed me up and had me fill out a W-2 and all that sort of thing. And I began to work at the local grocery store and the greatest source of pride for me at that time in my life was the fact that I was in a position to buy groceries for my family because my father couldn't care less. Say, well, Pastor, why are you sharing all this? I'm going to tell you something, mister. If you don't care about your wife as much or more than you care about yourself, you have no business being married. Amen. I'm going to tell you right now, you haven't got a lick of business. People say, well, you know, the Bible is so uh, oriented toward men. It's so misogynistic, you know. Everything is, is geared toward men. Honey, let me tell you something about the Bible. The Bible also, listen to me, children, puts the greatest amount to the greatest weight of responsibility upon men. The Bible calls for men to step up. The Bible calls for men not only to love their wives, but to love their children. Oh my goodness, I'm going to tell you something. Don't you ever get mixed up into thinking that the Bible just writes men a blank check. And says, you know, men can do whatever they want to do and women are oppressed. Oh, no, 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 no. No, if you study carefully the writings in God's Word, you will see that 
the male of our species bears the greatest weight of responsibility. God expects the man to be a provider. He expects the man to be a protector. He expects the man to care more about the well-being of his spouse and his family than he does even his own self, his own life. That is how much responsibility God places upon the man. But today that is not what I want to preach about. The Word of God in our primary text today is compared to water. Our primary text tells us in verse number 28 that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Hallelujah. The word of God is compared to water. Water is a miraculous substance in that it is completely non-abrasive. And yet it is able to clean the dirtiest of objects or the filthiest of bodies, the most muddied of human beings. It is used to flush out irritants and dangerous substances. If one gets a poison or a dangerous substance in their eye, the first response is generally to swiftly flush the eye with water. When one burns themselves, the first response is generally to run their burned skin under running water. To cool the burn and to wash away any remaining substance which may be further burning the skin by lingering upon the surface. Children are taught from an early age the benefits of washing with water. Yet for all the ability water possesses to clean and to cure, it is a substance without abrasion. Its efficiency is found in other characteristics of its makeup and not in its ability to scratch or grate away at the filth or the substance we seek to remove. One of the most interesting aspects of water is, uh, is found in the fact that it does what it does, listen to me carefully now, whether we are exposed to it for that purpose or not. In other words, <laughs> water's going to clean something dirty even if you didn't purposely put the water on it in order to clean it. If you put your dirty car out on the street and the sprinklers come on on your yard and that water starts to spray across the vehicle, the water's, uh, the water's going to clean the vehicle. You didn't turn it on for that purpose, did you? You didn't put the water on. You weren't trying to water the car. You were trying to water the lawn. But that water does what it does, whether or not that was your purpose or your intent. Come on now. Oh, I want to tell you, you put people under the anointed preached word of God. You put people where the unadulterated truth of God's word is being preached. And something is going to happen. Whether they mean for it to happen or not. They might not even have come to church expecting to be cleansed. Expecting to be straightened up. Expecting to be corrected, expecting to be improved upon, shall we say. <laughs> Doesn't matter, because water does what water does, hallelujah. If you get where the water is, honey, you're going to get wet. 
but you're also going to get clean. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you, we got a lot of churches in our world today who have become convinced that it is their job to, per, to preach an abrasive and corrosive message. After all, it's my job to scrub the sin and the dirt and the filth and the worldliness off of people. My heavens, no! It's not your job to scrub anything off of anybody. It's your job, Paul said to Timothy. Preach the word. Hallelujah. And it is by the washing of water by the word that God cleanses the church. But water is not abrasive. Sometimes I'm almost shocked at the ability of water to affect dirt and grime and filth. Last week, God gave me a day of energy. I don't get, these days, I don't get a whole lot of days when I'm just overcome by a rush of energy and suddenly I'm able to function like a regular human being for a little while and I'm able to do some things but I woke up and I felt good and I had to do some little thing and when I did it I looked and I said you know I really need to do this and I started doing this other little thing and then I looked and I said well that really needs bad I started doing this other and before I knew it I was just going and going and going and I had one little errand one little chore around the house done and I moved on to the next and I had another one done so I was able to get my garage quite a bit organized which shocked me had a lot of little stuff laying around. I got it all uh, organized and kind of compartmentalized and everything. And then next thing you know, I walked into the kitchen and I looked around the kitchen. Tommy and I moved in. It's almost a year ago. And we still have boxes all over the house, in the hallway, in different rooms, you know. The kitchen had boxes and there was stuff just piled high on the kitchen table. We couldn't use our table at all to eat because it was piled high with stuff that we just hadn't taken the time yet to find a place in the cabinets and what have you for. And all of a sudden I looked and I said, well, you know what, let me, let me see if I can clean off this table and get this or live. Sure would be nice if we could have a clean kitchen table. So I started working on that before too long I had the, the table cleaned off. Then I looked at the counters and I said man these counters are so crowded and cluttered and let me see if I can organize and I began to organize and clean the counters and then I looked at the stovetop and I said that stovetop could use a good clean and we've got one of those flat glass top uh, stoves you know and I thought that really needs a good clean and I started cleaning that and at one point I was trying to wipe down the countertop in the kitchen by the stove and there was some substance whether it was egg yolk or something just a couple drops that had kind of dried onto the surface of the uh, counter there you know and I'm trying to scrub, oh, I'm trying to scrape it I'm trying to do everything man that stuff don't want to come off no kind of way so I took the teapot now the water wasn't hot it was just Keep it just you know room temperature I took the teapot and I poured it on that substance there for a second and I let it sit there a couple of minutes and all of a sudden I went over it with a cloth and guess what those spots just picked right up they came right up off that counter now here I was scrubbing and scraping and trying so hard to get that loose from that counter and yet when I applied a little water no soap no chemical, just water. All of a sudden, it softened that substance right up. And now, all of a sudden, I could just come across with a, a, a paper towel, and boom, it came right up. And I literally thought to myself, boy, there's an illustration for a message right there. Look at how quickly and easily that water 
dealt with those spots. I'm going to tell you, the problem with the church is too many people say they believe in God and they believe the Lord is able, but truth be told, they don't believe nothing they're saying because they don't believe that God is able to work with people without their intervention. Why, if something is going to get done, it's going to require me preaching against it. Hallelujah. If I see a church member doing this, or if I see a church member doing that, I need to preach a message against it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I need to put some brillo into it. I need to apply an abrasive. I need to get a little corrosive. No, you don't. You need to preach the non-abrasive word of God. That's what you need Amen. to do. Because the washing of water by the word is more efficient than anything you can do in the way of human effort. Amen. And corrosiveness and abrasiveness folks that is not born of the spirit that is born of carnal fleshly minds the word of God declares in 1 Corinthians 6 9 through 12 know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. The word effeminate, by the way, for those of you that might uh, wrongly fall under conviction over this word, that is translated from a word that literally means simply soft. That's literally the word that it is translated from a word that means soft in the Greek. We'll talk about that in a future Wednesday night Bible study. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now mind you, the key to this passage, my friend, is found in the first few words. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now here's where the problem comes. You have the legalistic mindset which says that righteousness and unrighteousness are defined by our actions and our conduct. Whereas according to the word of God, righteousness is defined as being obtained by faith. So Paul's not saying Christians who act like this aren't going to inherit the kingdom of God. No, no, no. He's saying there are people who act like this who have no faith. And therefore, there is nothing in them that stands before God and is presented as righteous. Do you follow what I'm saying? There are a lot of people, folks, who come to church and they are not righteous. They're not saved. They're not Christians. They come for their wives. They come for their kids. They come for their husbands. They come for their boyfriend, their girlfriend. My father, for a period of time, when he and my mother first met, he went to church with her for a little while to, you know, kind of play the game. Never bought into it, never believed it, never accepted it, never had any interest in it, never had any use for it. But he went to church. There are a lot of people who go to the house of God, folks. And if you could see their heart as God sees their heart, I want to tell you something. God looks down at the church every Sunday, and he looks at the pew, and he sees one of two things, righteous unrighteous righteous unrighteous that's all God sees he said this one has the faith to save this one does not do you hear what I'm telling you now the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God there will be no unsaved people in heaven I got news for you there's not going to be God's not going to give a free pass to somebody who did not in fact believe this gospel it doesn't work that way but listen to what Paul says in verse 11. And such were some of you. 
Now listen. But ye are washed. But ye are sanctified. But ye are justified. How? In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Guess what he just did? He just tipped his hat to Acts 2.38. But ye are washed, how? In the name of the Lord Jesus. What did Adonai say to, to uh, Saul and after his conversion arise brother Saul and wash away thy sins doing what calling upon the name of the Lord but ye are washed but ye are sanctified but ye are justified how in the name of the Lord Jesus hallelujah and by the spirit of our God baptism in Jesus name Holy Ghost baptism Acts 238 glory to God Hallelujah. But ye are washed. But ye are sanctified. Meaning set apart. You're placed apart. So that you can be used. But ye are justified. There's an old definition for the term justified that's easy for God's people to remember. And it is this, just as if I'd never. It's what justified means. It means just as if I'd never. And God just wipes that all away, makes it like it never happened. Hallelujah. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified. How? In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Oh, hallelujah. When you believe and obey this gospel, you are washed. When you believe and obey this gospel, you are sanctified. You are set apart for God to be able to use you. But ye are justified. God puts you in a position as though your past had never happened. Oh, hallelujah. Listen to what Paul now says in verse 12. All things are lawful unto me. Because you got to remember, the Old Testament law is fulfilled in Christ. We're no longer under the law, we're under grace. Paul said, all things are lawful unto me. In other words, they're in the law that Moses wrote that applies to me. He said, but all things are not expedient. He said, just because, in effect, by the grace of God, I could get away with anything, in a sense. He said, by the same token, just because it, 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 I'm not condemned for doing certain things. He said, at the same time, that doesn't mean doing certain things is something I need to be doing. You follow what I'm telling you? Just because, just because in Germany you can drive on the Autobahn at 200 miles an hour, if you've never drawn a car, driven a car at those kind of speeds and on those kind of roads, might not be wise for you to try to do it. Just because you can. No, you can do it, legally you can do it, but at the same time you're likely to kill yourself because you've never done that kind of driving before. Do you follow what I'm saying? Amen. He said, all things are lawful for me. He said, but all things are not expedient. Then he repeats, all things are lawful for me. But I will not be brought under the power of any. That's why I tell people all the time. The Bible, you can get mad at me, Pentecostal, all you want to. The Bible does not say thou shalt not smoke. The Bible does not say thou shalt not drink. The Bible uh, does not speak specifically to some of these issues. But at the same time, just because they're lawful for me doesn't mean 
that they're expedient either, amen? Doesn't mean it's altogether a good idea to do these things either. So God expects us to use our head. He expects us not to try to take advantage of grace because if we try to take advantage of grace, then there's a very real possibility that our entire conversion experience was nothing more than a little game you're playing. You're not taking this thing at all seriously. No, if you take this thing seriously, then the fact that God has forgiven you past transgressions and allowed you to walk in newness of life, my goodness, out of gratitude and out of appreciation for what God has done for me, I'm going to do my best to live a good, decent, wholesome, holy, godly, righteous life. Am I telling the truth? But I'm not going to fall under the spirit of condemnation and guilt if I slip, if I fall, if I trip, if my humanity gets the best of me. No, why? Because there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh. They're not walking after the law, but they're walking after the spirit. They're walking in grace. Hallelujah. The miracle of salvation is wrought in the spiritual realm and it translates into the natural realm as we walk in fellowship with our Savior and King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ declared to be the Word of God is both our covering, listen to me children, Many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. He is our covering, but he is something more than our covering. He is also our cleanser. Because Jesus is called the living word of God. But ye are washed. How? With the washing of water by what? The word. <laughs> so the more exposed to the Lord you become, the more exposed you are to water. When we preach the Word of God, we ought to be preaching Jesus, not Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. We ought to be preaching the cross, not Mega. We ought to be preaching the resurrection and not Christian nationalism. Because that is the message that cleanses. That is the message which purifies. That is the message which inspires and nurtures and grows our faith. The preached word of God washes over us. And whether or not it is intended, it removes that which is offensive and uninvited and leaves in its place a surface that is gleaming. I remember many years ago, we had a fellow in our church in Dallas. <laughs> he was from Pentecostal background. He'd been in the Pentecostal church his whole life. And this particular fellow, uh, one Sunday, he said to me, he's a real country boy, and he said, Brother Charles, he said, you know, you don't get up in the pulpit and preach against everything, and you don't get up there and preach, thou shalt not do this, and thou shalt not do that. And he said, you know, your message is so different, and your approach is so different than what I grew up in and all that. He said, but why? is that I go home sometime feeling really bad about some of the stuff I'm doing. Why is it that sometimes I go home from church and I'm feeling like I need to fix some things. I need to change some things. I need to do some things a little different. Oh, Brother Willie, I'll tell you how it come. Because I preach the cleansing water of the word. It's not abrasive. It's non corrosive. But it'll cleanse you anyhow. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, you preach Jesus, you'd be shocked 
at the things that happen in people's lives, you'll be shocked how as they draw closer to the Lord Jesus Christ in their relationship with Him, how all of a sudden dead things start falling off and new things start growing. Hallelujah. I've seen so many people since I've been in progressive LGBT affirming ministry. I've heard people, I've had people in my church who would say things immediately after church. They would say things and honestly it would almost make my blood curl. It just, it hit my hearing and I was like, oh, oh, I hate to hear that person say that. Now, if I'd have been your average everyday Pentecostal preacher, next Sunday's message, I'd have preached all over that. But I don't preach corrosion. I don't preach abrasion. I preach the Word of God, and the Word of God is non-abrasive. It is the washing of water by the word. You just keep pouring it over and honey at some point after enough water's poured over that dirty old spot that spot's going to be gone. Hallelujah. You ever go to the beach walk on the beach in your bare feet and you know as you're walking on the beach you, you might get in the water for a while and you come out of the water and boy how do you get all kind of of the sand and stuff on your feet and your feet just get covered in that mess and you'll find yourself walking back into the water a little bit and just kind of swishing your foot around right and what happens there all that sand goes all that sand leaves hallelujah you're right back to squeaky clean all over again all it took was a little water you didn't have to scrub that off you didn't have to take a brillo pad to it. You didn't have to take a scraper to it. All you needed was a little water. While many believers seem to think the process of cleansing may not be fast enough. Nowhere are we called to employ our own techniques and apply abrasive tactics to more quickly remove the objectionable material. I'm going to tell you, that's the biggest problem in the church. Too many Christians, I don't know why they get it in their head, it took them forever to change, took them forever to grow, took them forever to mature, took them forever to learn, but then they look at the guy next to them and expect everything to happen overnight. Yep. I had a lady in my first church. I've told this story before. I had a woman in my first church. I was old time holiness back in those days, man. I'll tell you what, we had a list a mile long of rules and regulations that God's people were believed to, you know, we're supposed to live this certain way. And this one woman come to me one Sunday and she said, Brother Morrow, you know, with that just real humble, you know, almost, almost sugary sweetness. Oh, Brother Morrow, you know, June has been coming to our church now for a few months and stuff. And, you know, she, she still wears pants and she... She still wears makeup and, you know, cuts her hair and like that and blah, blah, blah. And I just feel led to talk to her. And I looked at this lady. Y'all think that my straightforwardness is new. It's something I've come into. You think I've just gotten crotchety in my old age. Honey, I was 19 years old. I looked at this woman and I said... Do you know what you ought to feel it to do? And she looked at me with that super sweet Church of God grin on her face and said, Why? And I said, You ought to feel it to keep your mouth shut. That's what I told her. 
all of a sudden her grin turned to a grimace. She looked at me like I just knocked her in the head with a frying pan. I looked at her and I said, listen, listen to me. That woman is growing. She is developing in the Lord. She's coming right along. I said, I don't care how long it takes her. Nobody should do anything simply to conform. That's the rule in most apostolic churches. That's the rule in most Pentecostal churches. Honey, they don't give a flying fig if you understand it, if you believe it, if you embrace it. No, 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 no. Just do it because we told you so. It's about conformity. I never, even in my most legalistic of days, I never believed in conformity for conformity's sake. Brother Gillum once told me something that I never forgot. He said, Chuck, the outside is the easiest part. He said, it's easy to get people to follow the rules and look the part. He said, the hard part is getting them to live it. The hard part is getting them to love people like Jesus loved them. The hard part is getting them to forgive. The hard part is getting them to pray for their enemies. The hard part is getting them to live in peace with all men. He said the easy part is getting them to change their wardrobe. So a lot of people think change isn't coming fast enough. You know what? You just keep your peace. You worry about your walk with God. Let every man work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. Don't you worry. It may take that person 20 years to get somewhere. It took you two months to get. But honey, when they get there, it'll stick and it'll be there for good. If you force it upon them, they may wind up becoming resentful. They may wind up leaving the church. They may wind up abandoning Christianity. They may wind up uh, losing out with God entirely. All because you were trying to force something that they didn't get. Every man, the word of God says, is given, listen to me, according to his ability to receive. Not everybody. That's why some people believe the gospel today, receive the Holy Ghost today, and then are baptized. Whereas other people believe the gospel today are baptized and it takes them 20 years for to receive the Holy Ghost. Everybody has to work it out. It's between them and God. The timing is on God's timetable, not on your timetable. If I got up here, and the, we've had people in our church, and I know good and well, because I know the kind of people that they come from. They expect the preacher to get up and preach the baptism of the Holy Ghost down your throat. They expect me to get up here and preach you into a state of depression, to preach you into a state of condemnation. If you're not seeking and you're not actively desiring and praying for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, bless God, you know what, Brother Charles, just don't preach enough on the Holy Ghost. If he preach on it more, more people would be getting the Holy Ghost. No, if I preach on it more, more people would be talking in tongues. But not everybody that talks in tongues gets the Holy Ghost. But everybody that gets the Holy Ghost talks in tongues. Say, preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying, I've seen people have what I call tongues experiences. Because they've been preached into a state of almost sheer terror. By some preacher who stood up there and convinced them, if Jesus come tonight, you're going to go to hell because you hadn't yet got the Holy Ghost. You need to get in this altar and seek the Holy Ghost and pray for the Holy Ghost till God pours out the Holy Ghost upon you or else you're going to be lost. And they preach people into a state of horror and a state of fear. And those people go down the altar and they got Sister Meanswell on one side. And they got Brother So-and-so on the other side. He-po, 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 he-po. 
And before too long, they're going, hippo, bobbity bob, hippo, bobbity bob, because they're mirroring what they're hearing. You follow what I'm saying, folks? And then some idiot jumps up and says, you got it, you got it! And they didn't get nothing but a tongues experience. That's why I like people. I, that's why I preach the way I preach. I prefer you get the Holy Ghost when you're at your machine at work. I prefer you get the Holy Ghost while you're driving your Uber. I prefer you get the Holy Ghost while you're in your bathtub. I prefer you get the Holy Ghost while you're at home watching one of our Bible studies. You know why? Because, honey, when you get the real thing and you really get it good, you will never deny it. You'll never turn your back on it. You will never doubt it. But you know how many people I've known over the years who were preached into a state of anxiety went down to the altar, had people all around them. If they didn't have one person yanking on their tongue, they had somebody patting them on the head. They didn't have somebody patting them on the head, they had somebody tapping them on the cheek. If they didn't have somebody tapping them on the cheek, they had somebody banging them on the forehead. And some of you folks out there watching, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm gonna tell you, when I got the Holy Ghost, I was a kid. I went down to the altar, the, the preacher preached on the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and I said, I want that. I sure enough want that. I went down the altar, I said, Lord, fill me with the Holy Ghost. Not one person was praying for me, not one person was touching me, not one person was laying hands on me, and all of a sudden there it went. Just between me and God. And I've never doubted it from that day till this. Hallelujah. Because it was between me and the Lord. I'm not trying. I'm, I keep banging that plant over. I'm not trying to preach people into some sort of an experience. You know, no. I am trying to help people understand the truth of God's Word. And as they come into an understanding, I've preached on it before, and I'm sure one day I'll preach on it again. There is what I call that aha moment. There are a lot of times when people, they may be this close to fully grasping everything about a certain subject, but there's something from their childhood, there's something from their past, there's something that they've heard preached, there's something that was taught them that is an obstacle and it stands in the way and they can't quite jump over that one last obstacle so they can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then you know what happens? One day, somebody gets up and preaches, and all it takes sometimes is one line out of the preacher's mouth. And all of a sudden, the preacher says something, and it's like a connection is made. All of a sudden, the wires touch, and the current is able to flow. And all of a sudden, everything comes into full focus, and boom, just like that, they receive because all of a sudden they have that aha moment I get it now I get it now I got it now I understand it I had a lady in my first church whose name was Judy I've talked about this before too Judy her husband was Tom and Judy was seeking the Holy Ghost. Tom had received the Holy Ghost one night in our church. And boy, she was excited for him. But she had been praying and wanting the Lord to fill her. And for some reason, she just was not receiving the Holy Ghost. And she was so despondent and so upset. And, and she told me, and I kept saying to her, I said, Judy, honey, the last thing in the world you need to do is worry about it. I said, listen, there's a reason. There's a reason. Either God's holding off for some reason or there's something that you're not quite catching. I said, but you know what? When it all comes together, it's going to happen. Don't worry about it. It'll happen. 
I may be up here preaching one day and some of you folks watching online all of a sudden while you're watching me preach all of a sudden you're going to find yourself speaking with other tongues as the spirit of God gives you the utterance because it just can happen like that it's like that connection that that uh, line suddenly connects and everything comes into focus and you're at that perfect moment where you're able to receive and I told Judy, I said, don't worry, honey, don't worry. Just let go and let God, let God take care of it. Don't worry about it. I'll tell you, my approach is not a UPC approach. UPC approach, honey, they practically beat you to death till you, till you uh, receive the Holy Ghost. They'll push it down your throat, preach it at you, and push it on you every minute. Oh, my God, have mercy. That's not how this preacher works. And I told her, I said, don't you worry. Say, God will take care of it. The day we organized my first church and we went from a, a mission work to an official congregation of the Church of God, we weren't going to have church that evening, so my district overseer asked me to come down and preach for him in Norwalk, Connecticut. So a bunch of my church folks, including Tom and Judy, drove down with it with me to Norwalk and I preached in another man's church and we had an outpouring of the Holy Ghost that night. We had a lot more people obviously. Our church we only had about 40 or 50 at that point and Brother Huggins church had probably 100, 120, 130 somewhere around there. All black folk. It was a Haitian church and we got in that and I preached. It was still me preaching. But all of a sudden that night, something clicked. And at the end of the service, I said, Whatsoever he saith unto thee, do it. The Lord said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Do it. Not beg for it, not plead for it, not cry for it, not pray for it, not wait for it. He said, Receive it. It's there. It's being handed to you. Just receive it. And all of a sudden, Judy threw, I watched her. She threw her hands up in the air and blah, 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 blah. just started speaking with other tongues. God filled her with the Holy Ghost. She cried all the way home. I rode with them in their car. She cried all the way home. It was so easy. It was, I can't believe it was so easy. It was so easy. But you see, she just had to wait till it all come together perfectly for her. I have no idea when I talked about that. It wasn't in my notes. More unbelievers are pushed away from the church and more believers run from the fellowship of God's people because the approach of the ministry is such that it is clear they do not use the word of God to clean, but rather some man-made method which is abrasive and corrosive and damaging. Hellfire and brimstone, my friend, is not water. It's brillo. Some have heard various statements which I have made while preaching and teaching. And they run out the door screaming, believing they know the full message of our church and the totality of our doctrine. But they do so to their own embarrassment. The truth is, if you do not understand our approach and the use of water instead of sandpaper, you cannot possibly understand the methods we employ to bring cleansing and healing to the life of God's people. In Matthew 23, 25 through 28, Jesus spoke these words, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, listen, for ye may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup, and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. 
Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Man, if that doesn't describe 80% of the evangelical world today, I don't know what does. Washing is a spiritual process. And thus the results of the washing, listen, are observed in the spiritual, not the natural. Spiritual changes then manifest in the natural world. But to try and force change in the natural is an exercise in futility. Why? Because forcing change in the natural has no impact on our spiritual man whatsoever. We must always seek to cleanse the inward as the outward will then also be impacted. Matthew 21, 28 through 30. One, the word of God said, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father. They say unto him, the first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, That the publicans, listen, That the publicans and the harlots Go into the kingdom of God before you. Oh, how we love to see instant change and progress. As believers, we often perceive the absence of visible change as disobedience or rebellion. But as it is demonstrated in this parable, it's the heart of the one son that motivated him to repent and do the will of his father after first saying, I will not. Whereas the other son who outwardly appeared willing to immediately do as his father had asked, it was that boy's heart that was revealed when he did nothing. Oh, there are a lot of people who go to church and they act like, oh, yes, bless God, like this idiot in Congress. I believe that book. Hallelujah. I believe everything in that book. You're a liar. You're a liar. You're a liar. You say it, but you don't do it. Then you got the other guy who doesn't say it, but turns around and does it. Hallelujah. Because why? It's all about where their heart is at. So while you may not see immediate response, you may not see an immediate change visibly in someone's life, you don't know what's going on in their heart. Amen. You don't know what changes are being made internally. The Word of God washes over us and creates change on the inside. That inward transformation then translates into an outward evolution. Psalm 51, 6 through 13. I'm trying to sew this up. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. 
Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Oh, I'm going to tell you, when we learn how to handle the water, when we learn how to handle the Word of God as water, it is non-corrosive, it is non-abrasive, hallelujah. Oh, all of a sudden, now we're in a better place to be a witness. Now we're in a better place to be a teacher. Now we're in a better place to be a testimony to the unbeliever. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Yeah. You'll be so much more effective. Hyssop or hyssop in the word of God in biblical use was a wild shrub of uncertain identity whose twigs were used for sprinkling in ancient Jewish rites of purification. So when the writer in the book of Psalms said, you know, cleanse me with hyssop, he's not saying scrub me with the branches saying, use that, dip that into the water, and then sprinkle the water on me. Hallelujah. Hyssop was used to sprinkle the water, not to scrub the dish or the pot. When we understand the method of cleansing prescribed by the Lord, we have no option but to abstain from barring anyone from access to the preached Word of God. How can we prevent any soul in need of cleansing from access to the washing waters of God's Word? My Lord, salvation today hinges upon the faith we hold in our hearts and not alone in the words we profess with our mouths. We may profess Christ until the mountains tremble and the sun falls from the sky. But in the end, that profession must be coupled with a genuine faith which we hold in our hearts and not merely profess with our lips. Many who call themselves Christians have accepted the gospel in their heads. They've chosen to accept as fact that which is unseen or unproven. But when their heart is put to the test, their faith falls short. You can generally tell which believers are those who profess faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but who do not genuinely embrace the faith necessary to save by their loveless conduct and compassionless ways. Therefore, Matthew 7, 12 through 23, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good or every healthy tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt or unhealthy tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. 
every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. A healthy fruit tree produces fruit. What is unseen is necessary to the production of that which is seen. You understand me now? What you, you look at the tree... You don't see the sap. You don't see the inside. You don't see the internal working of that. If it's rotten, if the tree is rotten and eaten up by bugs and uh, doesn't have sufficient uh, nourishment, you can't see that by looking at it on the outside. But what is unseen is what produces what is seen. This is why it's so important to understand the concept of the washing of water by the Word. Because the Word doesn't wash the outside. It washes the inside. It makes changes on the inside. And as it washes the inside and changes the inside, all of a sudden we eventually begin to see external things changing. Hallelujah. We may not be able to see within the trunk and branches, but that is where the life of the tree exists, not in the bark, not in the leaves. So while we may be tempted to approach others with an attitude of abrasive speech and tough talk, remember that the true cleansing agent whereby we attain and maintain our faith is the water of God's Word. Amen. And the Word of God, my friend, today is non-abrasive. Hallelujah. Praise.